The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the Word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Romans 13, 1. Yesterday was Friday and I made it an application day. Today we'll get more into the Word of God in terms of what it has to say about freedom. But first of all, I do want to read for you an article from Fox News, published September 5th by Joshua Rhett Miller. The title of the article is Gold Miners in Remote Alaska Town Want As Answers After Task Force Storms In. A 2006 photograph depicts downtown Chicken Alaska, a gold mining town home to just 17 full-time residents and dozens of seasonal workers. The Pebble Partnership believes a mine near Bristol Bay, Alaska could produce up to 107.4 million ounces of gold, with the gold selling at about, I guess, I haven't checked lately, but $1,800 an ounce. You do the math. <laughs> 107.4 million ounces of gold times $1,800. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, however, has said in a draft assessment that the project could have, quote, adverse impacts on the productivity and sustainability of the salmon fishery in the watershed. It's all about the money. Follow the money, people. Using exploration drill rigs, the Pebble Partnership is currently analyzing what may be the largest undeveloped copper deposit in North America, located in southwest Alaska. So they've got even more going for them. Over decades, the Pebble Partnership believes the deposit has the potential of producing 80.6 billion pounds of copper, 107.5 4 million ounces of gold and 5.6 billion pounds of molybdenum. I don't know what that is. I'll have to look it up. Some miners in Alaska want the feds to start digging for answers. A task force including members of 10 state and federal law enforcement agencies descended on a gold mine in the tiny town of Chicken, population 17, last month in what locals described as a raid. Uh, this, the state law enforcement agency was almost as big as the town. Quote, imagine coming up to your diggings only to see agents swarming over it like ants, wearing full body armor with jackets that say police emblazoned on them, and all packing sidearms, gold miner C.R. Hammond told the Alaska Dispatch. How would you have felt? You would be wondering. My, you know, the word he said in vain. What have I done now? <laughs> A spokesman for the Federal Environmental Protection Agency did not deny that agents were body armored and carrying guns, but said it was not a raid. The ongoing investigation conducted by the Environmental Crimes Task Force consisted of the EPA, ADEC, USFWS, ADFG, BLM, Coast Guard, 
FBI, Alaska State Troopers, NOAA, and U.S. Park Service. <laughs> that shows us we have far too many bureaucrats. <clears throat> but this does not mean a raid, the statement read. The task force members involved in the investigation during the week of August 19, 2013 were EPA's Criminal Investigation Division and Bureau of Land Management's Office of Law Enforcement and Security. In cooperation with ADEC's Environmental Crimes Unit. All of this is unconstitutional, by the way. Bureaucracies don't answer to anyone. They are not screened by Congress, which is their duty, but they don't do it. The investigation was into possible violations of the Clean Water Act, according to the EPA. The officers were part of the Alaska Environmental Crimes Task Force and visited the outpost near the Canadian border during the third week of August to investigate water discharges into rivers, streams, lakes, and oceans. Late Thursday, Alaska Governor Sean Parnell announced he had ordered an investigation into the incident, adding, quote, this level of intrusion and intimidation of Alaskans is absolutely unacceptable, end quote. EPA law enforcement officers, according to the statement, are not only authorized but required to carry firearms to safely and effectively perform their jobs. I thought guns were evil. Oh, well. Quote, this may include the arrest of offenders and the protection of public safety. The statement continued. Environmental law enforcement, like other forms of law enforcement, always involves the potential for physical, even armed, confrontation. Yeah, when you're dealing with that much money, I would say so. And they purchased that land, it's theirs. They just happen to be sitting on so much money, and the government doesn't like it. <laughs> Not at all, because money means power. And those who possess the most money possess the most power, and they don't want the power vested in the people. Who today has the most money in the United States of America? It's not Bill Gates. It's the federal government taking in about 2.7 to upwards of $3 trillion per year and then spending a trillion more on top of that. EPA law enforcement officers, according to the statement, I just read that, the investigation was launched based on sites with a regulatory history of non-compliance with the Clean Water Act and ongoing significant discharges which could be considered felony violations of the legislation. If you want to get rich in this country, forget it. <laughs> That's basically the message they're sending. That's a violation of the Constitution. But as I said, yesterday was application day. You can chew on that for a little bit. But now we're going to dig into the Word of God, see what it has to say concerning freedom and the rule of law, and also move into the concept of spiritual freedom. Romans 13.1 let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. This is addressing the criminal. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Rhetorical question. The answer, then do what is right and you will be commended. Verse 4. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword, capital punishment, for no reason. And again, there are exceptions. The Apostle Paul himself was an exception. He had done no wrong, but was beheaded by Nero. Christ did zero wrong and was executed by the Romans. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities 
not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Verse 6, This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Verse 7, Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. This means that one should never call the police officer a pig, should never degrade the police officer, should never do as many in our society do today, no matter how unfair the system in which we live, because the Apostle Paul definitely lived under an unfair system. But you are still to treat them with honor. When you see that uniform, you treat it with honor and respect. Verse 8, Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. When functioning, this means that when functioning under the integrity envelope, the integrity envelope being personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind, you fulfill the law by not reacting to injustice. And thus you are functioning under your very own spiritual life, which guards you against committing those sins which violate the divine establishment of freedom. Verse 9, the Apostle Paul brings out the commandments, for the commandments were given to Moses and was the first constitution of freedom. And what it says is, you shall not commit adultery, violation of a man to freely live with his wife without having her being stolen. You shall not murder, the, th the theft of a life. You shall not steal, the theft of property, income, etc. You shall not covet. That's the motivation behind all of these sins and the motivation behind the wrongdoing of socialism itself. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself is part of spiritual self-esteem. It's the same spiritual self-esteem that you find in Ephesians when Paul addresses the husband and says, Love your wives as you love yourself. That means you have reached spiritual self-esteem. So from that comes the actual function of the integrity envelope, impersonal love for all mankind, and personal love for God the Father. We could call that sharing the love of God. For God has personal love for us as believers. As unbelievers, he functioned toward us in impersonal love. And in fact, Christ died for all the sins of the world, meaning he died for the sins of unbeliever and believer alike. The difference is the believer has faith alone in Christ alone. The unbeliever seeks the broad way of salvation or doesn't care at all. So when functioning under the integrity of impersonal love, you fulfill the law. And a function of love derived from your spiritual self-esteem or confidence, living under a personal sense of destiny. A personal sense of destiny then motivates one in the area of personal love for God. And thus, by extension, motivates one in regards to developing impersonal love for all mankind. Verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Even if wronged by a neighbor, you do not react. Why? You're functioning under impersonal love, not on the basis of your neighbor's integrity or lack thereof, but on the basis of your integrity. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, freedom in a nation is no more effective than the morality, virtue, and sense of responsibility in all of its citizens. Now, for the Christian... Morality in itself is not the issue for the believer. For morality by itself, without a relationship of God, or under the concept of being a Christian legalist, leads to blind arrogance, and that's the worst of all arrogance, as a person involved in such is covered in dung, yet they cannot smell themselves. However, morality does protect establishment freedom and we have over the decades become an immoral country 
in terms of the falling marriage rate and the rising divorce rate. And it's destructive to family, and so we are not living under the divine institutions anymore. In fact, in college and even in school, high school, and even as a kid today, you are taught something totally different. You are taught that your volition, your decisions don't matter. It's a matter of your environment. You are taught that marriage doesn't matter. In fact, they've come out with books for little kids. I have two daddies, or I have two mommies. A total misinterpretation of family and marriage. And in nationalism, there's no nationalism. Internationalism is how we function under the concept of the United Nations, under the concept of always trying to think of how the world thinks of us, under the concept of always trying to seek world support, in some type of military action that we're planning to take. And so instead of, and as a result in this internationalism, one does not take into consideration the security of their own nation as they should, but they're trying to secure the world, which is client nation arrogance. That's why we have no right getting involved in a civil war in which Al Qaeda is being killed among other evil elements in the Arab world. One evil is killing another evil. Let evil kill each other. And if there is some security situation involved with Israel or Jordan, let them take care of it. After all, we give them plenty of money to do so, which is also internationalism and a violation, not that we should not give money to Israel for they are a very tiny country in a part of the world that hates America and they are part of our strategic interests but they can handle themselves just fine in this situation I just have one question why not bomb Iran the whole source of the problem overthrow the Ayatollahs and be done with it number two war we're just continuing here. Virtue, which is higher than morality, is what is required of believers. Virtue. And unfortunately, 99% of believers have no idea how to attain Christian virtue. Why? They're still living under the Mosaic Law. They're still functioning under morality and bragging about it. Anything the unbeliever can do is not the spiritual life. The unbeliever can be very moral. In fact, many unbelievers are far more moral than believers, but also comes out false concepts of morality, things not related to freedom, but things that are man-made. I remember one time visiting someone, and the only thing I heard from them the whole time I was there was them gossip about people smoking and drinking, smoking and drinking, smoking and drinking. And I'm not exaggerating. Every sentence was smoking and drinking. And just wait a bit. Here it comes, smoking and drinking. It was about to drive me insane. I had to bite my tongue and live under impersonal love toward legalists. A test in itself. I did fine. I didn't blow up and chew them out because I wasn't behind the pulpit. Behind the pulpit, I, if they were to be stupid enough to sit in front of me, well, that's a whole nother story. But, those are false concepts. That has nothing to do with freedom. A person smoking a cigarette does not violate your freedom. A person drinking a beer does not violate your freedom. Drunkenness, on the other hand, is a whole other story, for it is sin. But simple drinking for the purpose of not getting intoxicated, if you're not an alcoholic, you can do that, then that hurts no one. In fact, it's healthy for the person who drinks a little bit 
And uh, there are certain commands for people in leadership not to drink for certain very important reasons. But as far as smoking and drinking, that's their morality. It has nothing whatsoever to do with freedom. So you see how morality is twisted into a system of outright ignorance and arrogance. And in fact, becomes an impediment to freedom. And they don't understand virtue. Virtue is higher than morality. For any unbeliever can stop smoking and stop drinking, stop chewing, stop going with girls who do, stop doing all sorts of things. But that doesn't make them saved. They might be living a little better or their attitude might change into which you wish they had gone back to the way they were. But either way, they're unsaved unless they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not virtue. What they're doing is blind arrogance. We live under a higher system, higher than morality, and it is required of believers. Yet less than 1% of believers today even know what that virtue is about. Even believers who have sat and listened to Bible doctrine for many, many, many years still have that tendency toward legalism that is a roadblock that must be removed from their life. And the phone must be removed from mine as well during Bible class. Is it an emergency? Well, is it an emergency? Okay, then. Emergencies are different. We can handle those after Bible class. The unbeliever, unless it needs our immediate attention for some reason, but in emergencies, I don't see how I could help anyway. The, the unbeliever has no relationship with God, the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, the loser believer has no relationship with the filling of God the Holy Spirit which causes the believer to act just as an unbeliever in fact it's very difficult if not impossible to distinguish the unbeliever from the believer who's not utilizing the assets available to him in the unique spiritual life of this the unique church age the mystery doctrines musterion take the believer to a place that is far higher than morality Morality is included, but it's used in a proper way. Morality is included because that protects freedom. But it's higher than morality. As you note from Romans, it says if you function under the spiritual life, and that is personal love for God, impersonal love for mankind, a personal sense of destiny being the motivator, if you function under these, you've fulfilled the law. You're already functioning under morality. It's all part of it. And if you're out of fellowship, that's a whole different story. You could go immoral. Or you could go out of fellowship by going into the arrogance of morality. And that separates antinomian trend of the old sin nature, that is the hell raiser, from the legalistic trend of the old sin nature, that is the gossip, maligner, and judger. The only way to rise above all that is in your spiritual life. It brings the, the believer to a place of spiritual values, values that can never be destroyed by the great judgments of history. And we have some great judgments of history in terms of eschatology. We also have judgments in history during the church age that relate to the trends of history. Great judgments may be coming upon this nation in terms of the fourth and fifth cycle of discipline. We're already under the judgment of the third cycle of discipline in which most jobs now are part-time all 70 percent of all the new jobs they call that have been created so-called created I don't know what to believe they're all part-time for all I know they might be counting a job that goes from full-time to part-time as a job created why because it's a part-time job now a new job <laughs> that's how they finagle with numbers and boy, there'll be a lot of new jobs if they do it that way. A lot of new part-time jobs that don't pay much at all. Diddly squat. Nothing that one person could live on. Nothing that two people could live on. 
So we're under economic depression, especially when you put it into the context that during one month in 1984 under the Ronald Reagan administration, one million jobs were created in one month, not in five years. And they weren't all part-time. Chew on that. The mystery doctrines take the believer to a place that is far, far, far higher than mere morality. It brings the believer to a place of spiritual values, values that will never be destroyed by the great judgments of history. And we could have a judgment in terms of the fourth and fifth cycle of discipline, but the great judgments in history that are to come will be the one at the second advent. There'll be a removal of unbelievers from the earth. The uh, next great judgment in terms of uh, eschatology that we're looking forward to, excuse me, would be the Gog Revolution. And in that judgment, believers, or excuse me, unbelievers are cast from the earth. And then the third and last judgment will be the destruction of all the universe found in Second Peter chapter 3. And the resurrection body will survive that. But that will be the destruction of the earth and the universe. And then there will be the create that that'll be the last judgment of all of human history. Then there'll be the creation of a new heavens and a new earth, the new Jerusalem, all of which is described in Revelation. So we have three more to look forward to. There are actually four great judgments in history, the first being the flood. After the flood, we move into the post antediluvian system. Uh, civilization. Prior to that, it was the uh, pre-Diluvian civilization. And one thing to note is that after every great judgment, as far as the judgments in eschatology, the whole world starts out with believers, those things of value. So the first thing of value is faith alone in Christ alone. Why? It's eternal in value. And then after that, it's the unique spiritual life and its eternal value. So this is why the believer must live his life in the light of eternity and focus on those things that have true value. I know those Alaskan miners are probably very disappointed because they're sitting on billions and billions and billions upon billions upon billions, perhaps even more, maybe even going up higher than that. I, I'll have to do the math on that. And I probably will just out of curiosity. But they're sitting on so much money, it's unbelievable. But that has temporal value. And you notice these people when the, with their temporal value. For example, if there were a gold mine in our backyard, like there is in the backyard of Chicken, Alaska, Instead of you sitting here in Bible class, I believe all three of us would be digging and getting the wealth. But then all of a sudden, the EPA would come in and say, you can't dig in this wetland. Then you'd be highly disappointed. Well, don't be, because there's nothing there to start with. But if there was, don't be, because that's only temporal in value. What has true value is something the EPA can't get its hands on. They could if they, <laughs> they could if they would, if they could they would, but they can't. And that's what's going on in your soul with relationship to those things that have eternal value. So we must live our lives in the light of eternity. And those things that have true value are those things that will last through the next three judgments. First of all, we are going to receive a resurrection body at some point, maybe today, maybe a thousand years from now. We don't know, but we do know the rapture or the ex anastasis, the resurrection, the exit resurrection will occur in the future at some point. We know this as part of prophecy, but we don't know when. We're not to know when because if we did know when, most people in their stupidity would change their lifestyle. 
They might start selling everything they own or whatever. When in fact, we are to live one day at a time and take in the word of God day after day after day after day. And if the resurrection occurs in our lifetime, we are to do so all the way up until the point of the resurrection. But it may not occur in our lifetime, it may not occur in my lifetime, it may not occur in my son's li lifetime, and it may not occur in my great, 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 great grandson's lifetime. We just have no idea. And that's the way God designed it. And so there's the resurrection. That's not a judgment, of course, not for the world, but there will be an evaluation of believers. It's called the judgment throne, or the, but it's not. It's an evaluation. Bema means evaluation. It's not a true judgment. And we will be evaluated on the basis of what did you do with this unique spiritual life most people are going to be ashamed in a resurrection body, the greatest oxymoron of all human history. If you look at the illustrations online, if you're listening online, you can go under illustrations. Uh, the, uh, it'll be rather big, so you'll have to use your scroll bars. Scroll down uh, beyond the Satanology one. And go down to where it has the arrow pointing upward. And you will see on one side of the arrow, it's a double column retrogression, actually. And on one side of the column, you will see love for the cosmic system or love for the cosmos. On the other side, uh, you will see that the, that, that you'll see that's the motivation. Now at the bottom, you will see the whole function behind it, and that's matiotes. That's a vacuum in your stream of consciousness. Because you've rejected the word of God, your soul needs something in it, so it sucks in all the garbage of the cosmic system, and you get involved in Satan's cosmic system. And you stay there, even if you hear the word of God. Even if you hear 1 John 1, 9, you don't rebound. Why? You love the cosmic system. You love all it has to offer. I've seen people become animated during arguments as if they loved it. I've seen people become am animated watching arguments because they loved it. All you have to do is look at the popularity of Jerry Springer, and now that has gone into reality shows. The popularity of drama, of watching people bicker. Well, that's the cosmic system. Now, just because you watch it doesn't mean you're involved in it. I don't watch it. If you watch it, that's no, none of my business. Uh, as long as you're filled with the Spirit, maybe you could get some principles out of it, such as, aren't those people miserable? Look at those people fighting over silly, petty things. Why, that person right there is so petty, they're going to end up in trouble, and then you watch the show and they get in trouble. Well, you could watch it that way, that's fine. Or you could watch it the other way, none of my business. But the thing is, People love the cosmic system. That's just what I'm trying to bring out. People love it so much, it's on television, it's everywhere, on radio. Any sort of media loves to play that up because it makes them a profit. Why? Most believers love to live in the cosmic system. So there's a love for the cosmic system on the one hand, and that is the motivation then on the other hand, you learn everything related. That is the, since you love it, you take in everything related through the learning of demon doctrines. And that eventuates in the greatest oxymoron of history, shame in a resurrection body. You may want to look at that sometime if you get the chance. Because at some point, after Acts or at some time, we will be going over Satanology, and all of these things that I taught in 2005 will be brought up and even expounded upon. So we have a greater value in that everything that we should value as a believer is eternal in nature. If it's not eternal in nature, then you can call it temporal. What is temporal? You know, a lot of people have 
perverted the spiritual way of life into what you eat and what you drink, into some health system. They've gone off on a health kick, and so what do they do? They say, you're not spiritual if you eat this or that. You're not uh, spiritual if you drink this or that. Well, guess what? That's temporal. And anything the unbeliever can do, it's not the spiritual way of life. The unbeliever can have a change in diet and still be an unbeliever. What the unbeliever cannot do is rebound, be filled with the Spirit, have grace, doctrinal orientation, move to a personal sense of destiny, have personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind working in tandem in the integrity envelope or sharing the love of God. He cannot then there move to sharing the happiness of God and he cannot be occupied with the person of Christ. Those are things that are eternal in value except one, rebound, you won't need that in eternity because the old sin nature is temporary and um, as far as happiness goes it will be provided for you in heaven and you won't have to use those things anymore but it is the word of God which lives and abides forever and though the leaf will be turning color soon and falling off the tree and though the flowers may wither the word of God abides forever Isaiah 40 and since the word of God abides forever that is something that should be on number one top priority in your life taking in metabolizing the word of God and since God the Holy Spirit is eternal the filling of God the Holy Spirit should be of utmost importance to you and those and that is what separates the believer from the unbeliever morality of course is required by the unbeliever virtue is required of the believer however both believer and unbeliever alike must have a personal sense of responsibility that's why the Bible says of believers who do not provide for their family it says they are worse than infidels. That means they are worse than an unbeliever because an unbeliever even provides for his family is what it means. It doesn't mean they've lost their salvation. It means they're acting worse than an unbeliever. Why? They're not fulfilling their spiritual life. They've gotten into a sin of laziness, which is a sin. Number four. Now that does not include any, don't go weird and think that because someone's sick and lays around all the time that they're lazy. Now if they could choose otherwise, I'm sure they would choose to get up out of the bed and run around a bit. Number four, human freedom is earned by the recognition of the laws of divine establishment. The very recognition that our forefathers possessed in their soul when writing our Constitution and Bill of Rights. Now this is not a Christian country, but it is a country founded on God's divine establishment principles. You, ever, you say, it's not a Christian country? Why does it say on our currency, in God we trust? Because we trust in the divine establishment principles that God has set forth. And there were many unbelievers who signed off on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and they did so, and they signed off on the fact that that was provided by God. But just because you believe in God doesn't mean you're saved. But they signed off on it as being from God because they understood that divine establishment is from God, that these establishment principles are from God. So we are one nation under God's divine establishment. That's how it was envisioned. That's not how we operate anymore. Now we are a nation of men, not of laws. Human freedom is preserved from encroachment from within the borders of the nation, that is criminality, by the function of law enforcement. Human freedom is for, uh, preserved from encroachment by outside nations through 
the military establishment. Human freedom demands, here are some principles. Principle one, human freedom demands separation of church and state. Principle one, human freedom demands separation of church and state. And I want you to know that this is a double-edged sword. It means that believers have no right to superimpose, oft, superimpose often the false standards of so-called Christian laws on the state. That's one way the sword cuts, for that's an evil. Another way the sword cuts is that the state has no right to infringe upon the free exercise of religion peaceably. That is, they peaceably assemble. It includes the right to assemble. And that's tyranny, and that's an evil. So we have the separation of church and state, a two-edged sword. You have your responsibility as a Christian not to get involved in Christian activism or into crusader arrogance or to block an abortion clinic or to invade the privacy of a young lady by telling her that she shouldn't get an abortion. You don't know what she should do. You don't rule her life. You are trying, and, she's prob and she may or may not be saved. But if she's unsaved, you're trying to put your so-called Christian values, which are false and standard, upon a person. You never thought of witnessing to that person, did you? You're trying to get them to stop doing something that you consider murder. I'll tell you one thing. Let your 13-year-old daughter get pregnant. Have her sneak off and get an abortion. And I'll see how quickly your mind changes when I say, Okay, that's murder. Now what you need to do is send her to court for execution because she's murdered another human being. You want to know how fast their minds would change? You want to know how fast they would compromise on that so strongly held belief? As fast as I blink my eye, that's how fast. We should know that God creates human life, and he does so at birth. That's why our Lord describes spiritual life as beginning at birth because it's an analogy to human life that also begins at birth, period. That's why in Exodus, if two men are fighting and he accidentally runs into a pregnant woman watching the fight and she happens to miscarry, he is not charged with manslaughter. He is simply charged with the health of the woman and to pay back whatever difference for whatever health problems she went through. Today we would call it doctor bills, any type of doctor bills, medication she needed to take, time off work, etc. But it was all related to the woman, not the fetus. The fetus was miscarried. Now, if that fetus was a human life, it is a life, it's biological life. We know that. It has a heartbeat, like a dog has a heartbeat, and that's biological life. It jumps around in the womb. Insects, however, also jump around. It's a life, a biological life. It only becomes a human life when God breathes into the nostrils, Nashima. Nashima is the breath of life. Adam was formed from clay, it says. That's the dirt of the earth. And when he was formed, there was a body there. But there was no human life until God breathed into the nostrils. You see, Adam already had nostrils. He was already existing as a body. But he did not become a life, a human life, until God breathed into his nostrils, which already existed, the breath of life. You see, God does not need the woman to create life. That's part of a curse.
that's gonna, I'm going to lose a lot of people from that, but that's fine. If people can't understand the basics that God creates life, man and woman in copulation do not create life, then you're just an emotional nutbag and you'll never get anything. You're too mentally lazy or too guided by your emotions. Your emotions are your God. And you'll never get it. A lot of pastors who teach doctrine avoid that subject. I will not because it's part of the Word of God. And everything I've just told you is true 100%. You can look it up in Exodus yourself. It's very logical. For if that fetus was a human being, the man would be charged with manslaughter for accidentally killing a human being, but he's not. He's simply given a fine for the health of the woman, period, over and out. It's biblical. And the very fact that our Lord said, you must be born again, it's biblical. Life begins at birth. Spiritual life begins at the second birth. Now, you show me something in the Bible otherwise, and I don't want to hear about leaping in the womb because crickets leap. That's called reflex motility. And it was a reflex to, at that time, Elizabeth becoming excited. And since the fetus is mother-dependent, the nerve endings of the baby or the fetus too became excited and leapt in the womb. As much as men might want to believe it, there are not two old sin natures functioning within the woman while she's pregnant. It may seem so, but it's not. My wife was totally the opposite. She became calm during pregnancy. Most women become berserko. ex-wife that is. Human freedom is earned by the recognition of the laws of divine establishment. Human freedom is pre preserved by the laws of divine establishment. So the principle I gave, gave you is human freedom demands separation of church and state. The second principle, human freedom demands separation of the military and the state. Do you know that the United States of America has remained one of the few places in all of history that recognizes the principle that our military must be subordinate to a civilian government as they are servants of the people to keep us free. And this has been a great protection for us that we've even recognized it from military dictatorships. Most countries don't recognize this. And as we go down as a country, there's going to be a temptation if we go down that the military take over and handle some things. But that would be a violation. Actually, we've already had a minor violation or you might not consider it minor because military dictatorships usually involve a great tyranny. Let me tell you about something that recently happened that is a violation of this. And it's the first violation that I can know of, though there may be others in history, especially during the Civil War. But after the Boston bombing, there was a lockdown of Boston. Soldiers and police locked down an area of Boston without warrant, made everyone walk outside of their homes, and each and every home was searched. because two nuts, or three or four, I don't know how many, decided to blow up pressure cookers, or, eight, or two pressure cookers. And you say, well, wouldn't that be a time of martial law? No, first time. It didn't, we didn't even have martial law on 9-11. Anyway, it just shows how easily in time of crisis people will give up their freedom, and you shouldn't. 
But if the authorities ask you to, you have to follow the authority. But I'm saying it shouldn't happen is what I'm saying. But it does happen, and that was probably a test run to see if the people would be compliant, and they were, and should be. They voted for these people. And that goes along the principle of, for those who are evil and wish to take our freedom, never let a good crisis go to waste. Let's we'll see how much power we can attain. That's why I'm very suspicious of any crisis that comes along during the times in which we live, because they said it. Anyway, how should you act during these times when something like that happens? You obey the authorities. You obey the authorities. Let me put it that way. And that was just an example. So we have the military is good in its rightful function. What is the rightful function of the military? Killing people and breaking things, as Rush Limbaugh would say. That's what the military does. But the military as an institution is terrible when it comes to governing, when it comes to administration, when it comes to the affairs of policy making. It's terrible. It's not made for that. Now nations south of our border have been plagued by the tyranny of military dictatorships. There's been one in Mexico before. There have been uh, military di dictatorships all throughout Latin America, South America. There have been dic uh, military dictatorships in all parts of the world. Right now there's a military dictatorship in Egypt. We've been one of the few countries that has lasted 230 seven years without a military dictatorship. That's a good record. The function of law enforcement must be separated from the state in that whatever, third, is that the third one? Third principle. The function of law enforcement must be separated from the state in that whatever political party is in power should not in any way utilize law enforcement assets to trounce on political foes. We've seen a breakdown in this area for many years. And for many, many, many years. It was said of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover that he was the true man behind the curtain. He was the true ruler. And if you uh, ever get a chance to watch a show I watched, I believe it's called Ten Things You Didn't Know. I found it on Amazon. It is not, I don't think, on uh, Netflix, but it went into the history of J. Edgar Hoover, and during his reign, he became one of the greatest blackmailers in all of history through the function of violating the privacy of individuals, especially those civilians who were in places of leadership. So that was a time when law enforcement actually tried to take over the function of government through blackmailing. And if you haven't seen that yet, those of you listening face to face, I encourage you to watch it. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to see how he made pretzels out of presidents. How they had to walk out on the White House lawn in order to make policy statements so that J. Edgar Hoover couldn't hear them. If he had the technology that we have today, my goodness. And with the power mad people we have in office today and the technology we have today, my goodness. You know that a couple was, uh, well, a lady went on an internet search because she wanted a pressure cooker. Her husband went on the internet because he was going to go on a trip and he looked up a backpack. He was going to go backpacking. The FBI showed up at their door. You don't think our internet searches are being watched? Now of course they had to use certain language like pressure cooker and backpack. So the FBI put two and two together. These are terrorists. 
and they came knocking on their door. So watch out with your internet searches. I will not enter search pressure cooker or backpack together. <laughs> you think you have freedom. You don't have freedom when you don't have privacy. So that is the separation of law enforcement from the state, and we can see we're failing in that area. Number four, human freedom demands separation of business enterprise and the state. This separation is crucial for the full function of free enterprise, for without which no prosperity will come to a country. Every business, large or small, excepting those that acquire wealth through theft or intimidation, we have laws for that, every business has every right to be successful, such as Chicken Alaska, to make as much money as possible, and to do it efficiently, such as Walmart. Period. That's God's system called capitalism, and it resulted in the one-time most wealthy country on the face of the earth, the United States of America. Now we're in depression. Why? We don't follow this. The state's involved in every form of business. The state took over General Motors and put the unions in charge. The state basically took over banking when they banks allowed the money to come in. Now they any time you take money from anyone who is not gracious, and the federal government's not gracious, you're enslaved to them. Any time you borrow money, you're enslaved to that person. But they borrowed the money, and they became enslaved, and the government doesn't want them to pay it back. Why? They like to be in power over these entities. That starts fascism, big business linking up with big government. And you have to move from some sort of freedom to something a little bit acceptable. And for Americans, fascism is a bit more acceptable than communism. But it's on the road to a socialist state no matter what. Fascism in, in itself has components of socialism. So human freedom is purchased by military victory against enemies outside the state and by successful law enforcement against criminals inside the state. The Ten Commandments, outside of the holy day that is set apart for Israel, list mandates for the entire human race for the preservation of human freedom. As the God of divine establishment, believer and unbeliever alike, should have no other God set before them such as the God of Socialism, which always involves the exaltation of a ruler under a socialist regime. All you have to do is watch some show on North Korea. Every North Korean has a picture of Kim Jong-il their, in their home, and they must worship him like a god, and they do. The socialist leader, Hugo Chavez, who recently died of cancer and went to hell. He, uh, it was mentioned, I don't know if it ever happened, they were going to embalm him and they were going to uh, put him for public view forever. Or they think forever. Nothing lasts forever. Uh, just like the Chinese did with Chairman Mao. Chairman Mao is entombed and he comes out for public view. Lately, People have noted that he, it just looks like a bunch of makeup now because it, his body is starting to decompose anyway. So I don't know if they're still showing it, but up through the 1990s, they were showing on, uh, on occasion, either his death or birthday, probably his birthday, they would bring out his bodies, and Chinese by the hundreds of thousands would pass by, and look at their great socialist leader, Mao Zedong, who starved more people than we can ever imagine. So this is what William Penn had to say concerning that. He said, if a nation is not governed by God, that nation will be governed by tyrants. So if this nation is not governed by 
the laws of divine establishment, we will be governed by tyrants. And far too often now, especially in mainstream media, ABC, NBC, CNN, PMS, NBC, all of those tend to treat any of the leaders that they like as gods. That's because they do not believe in the laws of divine establishment. I don't get my news from them because I don't trust them. I do get some news from Fox News. I get some news from Breitbart. I get some news from The Blaze. I get some news that is correct and uh, resourced and everything else because uh, we have freedom to do so. In the past, we didn't. And I much rather trust Breitbart than I do CNN. And I trust The Blaze far more than I do MSNBC. Those are the ones who are touting propaganda, peace and prosperity when there is no peace and prosperity. Well, tomorrow we will start with our study of spiritual freedom. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning what freedom is all about. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.